It's good to see you this morning. We're glad we're here. You're here this morning. Glad we have the opportunity uh, for us to worship together. And if you are new with us this morning, particularly if this is your first time, my name is Barry Cole. I'm the pastor here. And let me just say welcome to Aviano Baptist Church. Um, we are a church family that is a group of imperfect people that are seeking to know our perfect Savior better see what a difference he can make in our lives so that together we can go out into this community or out into whatever community God has us in uh, to lead others to love him. And so if that sounds like the church for you, the place that you're looking for, we're glad you're here today. Let me draw your attention to a couple of announcements. Oh, one other thing, if this is your first time with us, you should have gotten one of these when you came in. Uh, and it'd be in better shape than this one because I've been carrying this around in my pocket for the last two weeks. But you should have gotten one of these when you came in. Um, it just says, tell us about yourself. So fill it out. Uh, help us get to know you a little bit. There is an offering plate at the back of both, by both exit doors. And feel free to drop it in there on the way out of the service after the service today. Uh, on the back of that, by the way, this is for everybody, not just first-time guests. It says prayer requests. And so if there's any way that we can be praying for you, um, grab one of these. They're out in the Welcome Center. I put a stack of them on the baptistry as well. But they're out in the Welcome Center there by the offering plate when you first come in. Um, so feel free to grab one right on there how it is that we can be praying for you. Because I pray over those. Our deacons pray over those. We have a, a team of prayer warriors that prays over these. So let us know how we can pray for you. You too, drop them in the offering plate on the way out. Okay, so let me draw your attention to a couple of announcements that are going on. Um, we are users of U, the YouVersion Bible app, and so if you're new here, I encourage you to create a YouVersion account. It's, I've got a horrible echo up here, Chelsea, and I'm not sure if it's just the room or if it's the microphone or a little bit of both. Um, but we use the YouVersion Bible app. You can create an account for free. Um, and as you go into it, you'll find our service as an event there every week. And it's not, it's not intuitive how to find that. There we go, that's better. But when you get into you version, there should be like three lines at the bottom. Just tap on that, you'll see events. Click on that, you'll find our service there. Open it up, and in our service every week, you'll see our announcements listed there, as well as you'll see some information on how to give, how to give your tithes and offerings here. Um, a link to our Bible reading plan we're doing together as a community, um, and also the scripture for the morning service. So you'll find the announcements there. We also send them out as an email, so if you want to get on our email list, just let us know that if you're not on it. We put them on the Facebook page, we share them in the WhatsApp group. So plenty of ways that you can check them out. So I'm not going to read all the announcements to you. I do encourage you to check them out in one of those places. I do want to draw your attention to just a couple of things, some stuff that's happening this week in particular, and then some th big things on our horizon. First of all, just to mention once again, downstairs in the youth room, so if you go down the stairs and make a left, um, we're having kind of a book fair. So we got a whole bunch of books down there. Um, and let me just mention this because I didn't mention this earlier. Because think you're seated together as families or we're socially distant, if you want to pull your mask down while you're seated, you can do that. So, so general rule of thumb, while you're seated, you can pull the mask down. When we're standing, that means we're either coming in or going out or we're singing. So while you're standing, mask up. While you're seated, you can pull it down. So that'll give you a good chunk of the service you can be with your mask down if you want. Anyway, downstairs, anyway, downstairs, go down, go down to the stairs, make a left, left, you'll see a whole bunch of books in there. So we're kind of having a book fair. We've got a lot of marriage books, parenting books, um, men's and women's studies, Bible and theology books, discipleship, a lot of stuff down there. Go down, check it out. It's free. Take whatever you want. Um, we just need to pare down before we move. We are, we are moving to a new facility in December, if you're new with us, just so you know that. But we're trying to pare down before that happens. So go down there, check it out. If you were here last week and you went down to check out the book fair, I may have locked you in the building. Um, I'm not going to do that. I promise you I will not do that today. So if you go down to the book fair, I will not lock you into the building today. Um, so check that out after the service. Um, also, Awana registration has opened. And so if you want to get your kids in Awana, you can do that now. On the Facebook page or on the website, avianobaptist.church, you'll find the registration link for Awana. All the registration has to be done online, so check it out if you haven't signed up your kids for Awana yet. It will start on the 13th of September. That's the second Sunday in September. Uh, and so check, check that out, awana at avianobaptist.church. That's the email address to contact Penny Bird, our Awana commander. Ladies, Ladies Lift is coming up this week. Ladies, Ladies in fellowship together, together on Friday at 11 o'clock at the bowling alley. It's going to be a little competition, friendly competition. So you'll find information on how to sign up for that on the church Facebook page. So just know that's coming up. 
And then the last thing I want to say before I, we have two very special announcements, one from our children's ministry director, one from a, a new couple that's going to be leading our youth group. We're super excited about that. Um, but before we get to that, I just want to mention, I put a video on the Facebook page this past week talking about our fundraiser, our church fundraiser. We're in the season I just mentioned a moment ago. We are moving to a new facility on the 1st of December. Um, and we, there's a lot of work that has to be done to that building that we are paying for a portion of it, not all of it. Check that video out. I tried to keep it short, but I'm chatty, so it's not short. It's 15 minutes long. But I tried to answer all the questions, why and where and when, and then how you can be involved. I tried to answer all of those questions on that. So here's the, as we're in this season of a fundraiser, what I'm asking you to do is pray about how the Lord would have you to be involved in that. Um, here's the good news that we that God has already provided all the resources we need to pay for our portion of the renovation. Here's the bad news. It's still in a lot of our pockets. So what we're, we're asking for you to do is just be in prayer about how God will use you in that. And then on the 30th of August, the last Sunday of this month, we're going to have a time of commitment. And everyone, we're going to ask everyone to fill out a commitment card. So even if your commitment is just the only thing we can do is pray right now. And if that's the only thing that you can do, then commit to do that. Everyone will fill out a commitment card. We'll have a time at the end of the service. We'll pray together for this new facility. And we'll come up and we'll put the commitment cards in the offering plates. But you pray about how the Lord would, would lead you to give to that renovation fund. Um, if you know already that the Lord's leading you to give and how much you can give right now, instructions for how to do that are on the, web, on the Facebook page. Jeannie and I have already given. We just knew. The Lord's leading us. This is the amount. So we've already done that. You can do that or you can wait till the 30th and then you know, if you want us to take some time and pray over it. So you be in prayer about that and how the Lord would use you uh, in respect to that building renovation project. Okay, we're going to hear from Sonia Serta, our children's ministry director, and then we'll hear from Michael Stoiber, our new youth ministry director. So come on up and tell us about children's ministry, Sonia. So we have six months uh, to fifth grade. So we do have four different classrooms. We have nursery, preschool, K through second, and then third to fifth. So that being said, we do need volunteers. I promise you I'm not asking you to volunteer to fit my agenda or fill a slot um, on Sign Up Genius. I am definitely asking you to volunteer. That way you can be a part um, of the foundation of our children's faith. Um, because one day they will be where you are, um, adults out in the world. And um, it's an honor to be a part of them leading more to Christ. Because it's not just our job to lead more to Christ. It's also going to be their job one day. Um, I do um, have an email if you have any questions or are interested in volunteering. Um, children's at Aviano Baptist Church. And then today after this service, I will be posting kind of a summary of this. So you'll see my name up on the Facebook page. And then, unless I'm out of town, I'm usually here um, bouncing around both services, um, so you can definitely pull me aside if you have any questions. Um, August 23rd is actually um, Promotion Sunday, so if your child is going into the next grade, next Sunday will be the day for them to do so. And on September 20th, we will be having a volunteer training. Um, that way you can be a little more familiar with our protocols, the classroom curriculum, um, and I can answer any questions you have um, if you do decide to volunteer. Um, so thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Michael Soiber, Natasha is my wife, and we're going to be taking over the youth ministry. <laughs> um, we're going to be teaching grades uh, 6 through 12 at the second service at 1045 down in what is currently the cry room, which will become the youth room. Um, we're going to be going over uh, answers in Genesis, going over uh, defending your faith and cementing yourself in your faith. And if you guys have any questions, please pull us aside after service today, and we'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Thank you. We're, su we're super excited about how God's leading us, how he's how brought this couple to restart our youth ministry up. Um, and starting next week, if you want to put your kids in youth ministry, there'll be the, we'll add that to the sign-up piece. So as your RSVP, that'll be an option as well to sign them up for the youth ministry. Because again, like everything else with COVID, there's a limited number of kids we can put in that room. Well, we're glad you're here this morning. Glad we have the opportunity to worship together. So let's stand, masks up, as we sing some praises to our Lord. All right, good morning, everybody. This is Liz, this is Mark, or this is Small.
small segment of the uh, I'll be on the worship team. Um, since everyone else is plugging their stuff, I'm going to plug a couple more things, little bonus announcements for you today. Um, if you like to sing, want to come up and sing with us, please get with me or Jeannie in front. Uh, if you play an instrument, even better. Once again, come see us. We'll get you plugged in. Also, even more crucial than um, worship team is the audiovisual in the back. Uh, we have, I think, like three volunteers right now for audiovisual, which is not enough. Uh, so it, if, even if you're not technologically gifted, that's okay. It's very easy. We try to make it as foolproof as possible. Uh, just get with... Um, Get with Jeannie or get with Chelsea in the back. She's at the sound booth right now, and um, they will hook you up. Anyway, um, that's my spiel. Before we get started in worship, uh, please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We just thank you so much for this time together where we can come and get to know more about you, Lord. Uh, we pray for Pastor Barry that you speak through him and the word that he brings. Uh, we pray that you would help prepare our hearts in worship. Uh, just help us to set aside all distractions, Lord. Help us to uh, just to be focused on you and to, to be ready to, to learn more about you and to live for you in our daily lives. Uh, we know that your word says when two or more are gathered in your name that you are here with us. We pray that you, um, that you come and fill this room with your spirit and that you just help us to, to honestly worship you and to truly just Take this Take time, time to, 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 grow to grow ourselves, Lord God. We love you and we praise you. In your son Jesus Christ's name, amen. So this is a new song. Well, new to the church, but not new, new. Um, it's Jesus, Friend of Sinners by Casting Crown. So if you know it, feel free to sing along. The more you guys sing, the better. I love hearing the whole chorus of voices. So. Jesus, friend of sinners, we have strayed so far away. We cut down people in your name, but the sword was never ours to sing. Jesus, friend of sinners, the truth's become so hard to see. The world is on their way to you, but they're tripping over me. Always looking around, but never looking up. I'm so double-minded. A plank God saint with dirty hands and a heart divided. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers. Let our hearts be led by mercy. Help us reach with open hearts and open doors. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, break our hearts for what breaks yours. Jesus, friend of sinners, who's riding in the sand? Just turn away and the stones fall from their hands. Help us to remember we are all the least of these. Let the memory of your mercy bring your people to their knees. Nobody knows no, what we're for, only what we're against when we judge the wounded. What if we put down our signs, crossed over the line, and love like you did? Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers. Let our hearts be led by mercy. Help us reach with open hearts and open doors. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, Break our hearts for what breaks yours. You love every lost cause. You reach for the outcast. For the leopard and the lame. They're the reason that you came. Lord, 
Bardo's that lost cause, and I was that outcast. But you died for the sinners just like me, a grateful leopard at your feet. Cause you are good, you are good, and your love endures forever. You are good, you are good, and your love endures forever. Cause you are good, you are good, and your love endures forever. Oh Jesus, friend of sinners, Open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers. Let our hearts be led by mercy. Help us reach with open hearts and open doors. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, break our hearts for what breaks yours. And I was the lost cause. are spent in vanity and pride caring not my lord was crucified knowing that it was for me he died on calvary by god's word at last my sin i learned then i trembled soul imploring turn to Calvary. There your mercy and your grace will spring. There your pardon multiply to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. given Jesus everything. Now I gladly know him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. There your mercy and your grace will spring. There your pardon multiply to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span. At Calvary, yeah. there your mercy and your grace will spring. There your pardon multiply to me. There my burden so found liberty. At Calvary, one more time. There your mercy and your grace will spring. There your pardon multiply to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. There my burden so found liberty. 
Liberty at Calvary. You may be seated. The impudent, the audacity, the unmitigated god! You call it out! Now, get ready! I'm sure y'all have seen that movie. It is one of the absolute favorites in our home. And I love the way that the, the end of that gaze into the face of fear and just echo fear, 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 fear. And we giggle at that. Our, our family, we're movie quoters. Now, if you, you may not have known that about us. We could have entire conversations between my wife and I, between us and our kids, and not speak an original word. The entire thing will just string movie quotes together. That, I think, is my favorite scene in that movie, and it gets quoted over and over and over again. And we and giggle, giggle about, about it, you know, it makes, it makes us laugh, laugh just a little bit to see the Grinch and Jim Carrey, that living cartoon, cartoon um, playing out that role. And just, just that, that scene, scene makes us giggle, giggle a little bit. But, but, but if, if you, you are, are struggling, struggling with fear, fear, and if fear, fear is, something is something that's a reality, reality in your life, life that you deal with on a regular basis, basis it's no it's laughing matter. No and it's, it's nothing, nothing for you to giggle at. And there's a right kind of fear and a wrong kind of fear. There's a good, There's a good kind, kind of fear. There's that, that kind, kind of fear that keeps us from swimming with the sharks. sharks. That's, That's good, good fear. fear. There's, There's good, good fear that fear keeps us from going, going up to that bear, bear cub in the woods, even though it's cute and fuzzy, and going up to pet it. That's, That's good, good fear, fear that, that keeps us from doing that. that. But There's, There's a, kind a kind of fear that can make us shrink back. You know, those moments when we should take a stand for Christ. We should trust Him and we know, but we doubt and we fear. That's the bad kind of fear. And it causes, and it causes us, us to become, become ineffective, ineffective witnesses, witnesses for him. For him. And, and, and worse, worse even than that, John, not just ineffective witnesses, witnesses but, we, but we, we cease to fulfill the purpose that he saved, saved us and left, left us here, here to, do to do often because, because we, give we give in to fear. To fear. Now, we're now we're continuing in our Heroes, our heroes of the Faith, of the faith Bible, Bible study series. series. We've been doing this for the last several weeks now. So join me this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 1. That's where we're going to be this morning. I talked, I talked about it very about briefly, briefly last, last week, week, this letter of 2 Timothy. Timothy. Chelsea, I think Chelsea, I'm still, I think still getting an echo, or I'm getting one again. I don't know. I, mean, I, I sound a little more like the Grinch. Gaze into the face of fear. A little more echo up here. I talked a little bit about 2 Timothy last week, and this, these are the last known written words of the Apostle Paul. In fact, he says over in chapter 4, that's much better. I don't know what you did, but that's much better. He says over in chapter 4, he said, my, my, I'm being poured out as a drink offering, and my time of departure is at hand. It seemed to me that, that as Paul wrote this letter, that he knew his execution was, was going to happen any time now. And there's something in him that said the very last thing, or one of the very last things that I need to do is to fire off a letter to Timothy. And so that, that makes it important and instructive for us by this point in time, Paul and Timothy have known each other probably around 15 years. We don't know the timing exactly. Paul first encounters Timothy on his second missionary journey. Acts chapter 16, he, he encounters Timothy. He's a young believer there. And from that point forward, when 2 Timothy is written, his, well, Paul's second missionary journey, so probably the early 50s A.D., 52, 53, probably somewhere around that neck of the woods. 2 Timothy is written mid to late 60s, 66, 67 A.D., somewhere around there. About 15 years they've known each other. They've developed this relationship over the course of time where Paul refers to Timothy as his son, his child in the faith. That's the kind of father-son relationship that they have. And so what we see here in 2 Timothy are, are Paul's final instructions, his, his final encouragements to this one that he has invested himself and in, poured himself into as a mentor for the last probably 15 years, and the very last things he wants to say to him. His final instructions, his final encouragements to Timothy. And one of the things that he, that he makes sure he mentions in this letter 
is Timothy's ongoing struggle with fear. And I don't think that Timothy is alone in struggling with fear. Maybe you're here this morning and that's your issue. That's the one thing, is sort of a besetting, it's a constant companion that you don't want, but it's there. I don't think Timothy's alone. And I want us to look and see what does Paul have to say to Timothy? And as we've been looking at these heroes of the faith, it's not just what's going on in their life, but, but their life and their, and their examples are telling and, and instructive for us. What does Paul have to say to Timothy about this topic of fear? What does he have to say to us? As you follow along, 2 Timothy chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 6 through 12. And he says, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. And for this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, once again, we we come and we open up your word. And we're absolutely desperate for a touch from you. Lord, as I stand behind this this stand to, to proclaim your word, Lord, I realize how inadequate I am to that task absolutely need you to speak through me and father on our own without your spirit helping us we're absolutely incapable of understanding discerning the spiritual truths you have for our lives now we know you're going to be faithful to your promise to guide us into all truth and to teach us all things and father it's my prayer right now that you would help us to hear and to listen and to respond So that this issue in our lives, fear, becomes something that we talk about as a praise report for something that you conquered once and for all. Lord, would you bless us in these next few moments in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And here's the big idea. If you're new with us this morning, I I like to pull out what I call the big idea, sort of the main passage, the main thought of the passage. This, This is one of my favorite books of the Bible, 2 Timothy. Because in it, we get these very real mentorship, discipleship thoughts from Paul to Timothy. I've read this book many, many times, taught it many, many times. And as I studied for for this message this morning, the the verse that I just kept coming back to, this is the central theme, is verse 6. Everything between verses 6 through 12 centers around that everything else is said in support of what he said in verse 6 and this is the big idea of it that timothy you are dealing with fear in your life and here's the remedy here's the answer here's the response continually tap in to the power of the holy spirit As believers in Christ, you and I have the Holy Spirit. That moment you repented of sin and trusted in Christ, He gave you the gift of His Holy Spirit. And He said, you want to experience victory. Continually tap into the power of the Holy Spirit so you can overcome fear and live boldly for Christ. That's the big idea, I think, of these these verses, verse 6 through 12 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. And what I want us to do this morning... And just kind of take a look at what Paul has to say to Timothy about fear and how he should respond to it and how he can overcome it, how, what he ought to do about it. First thing, though, he kind of lays out, I think, for Timothy the cause of fear. You know, it's a reality that every one of us who are saved have the Holy Spirit of God within us. And so it begs the question, doesn't it? What do we have to fear? Why would we ever fear? And I think Paul lays out for Timothy the the cause of it. There's some root causes here that are feeding that, that are linked to it. 
And one of the things that Paul talks about, that Timothy's fear is fed by what I'm calling spiritual drift. Drift is a biblical term. It's a biblical concept. It describes what happens in many believers' life, what I believe was happening in Timothy's life, this idea of drift. The Hebrew writer says this, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we don't what? Drift. You know what drift is? It's when you just sort of are floating along, in your spiritual life, right? You're not really spending time in the Word of God on a regular basis, you're just kind of going along. And you say, well, I don't really have time to read the Bible today. I'm a little bit tired, a lot of things going on. You know, I got up a little bit late, I don't really have time to pray today. There's just a lot on the calendar today. You know, it's been a long day, it's been a long week, I don't have time for Bible study, I don't have time to get involved in, in a home group. You know what, tomorrow rolls around, you know, I can't, I can't read the Word of God today either, I can't pray today either. And listen, none of those things by themselves are all that detrimental to your spiritual life. But collectively, look how easy it is and look how far, that's drift. And I think that's what was going on in Timothy's life. This wasn't a one-time sudden low. You've been in a low, right, a low where your spiritual life just feels dry. There's a season where you feel so dry, right? We've all had that lull, I think. And it feels like the the ceiling's made of Kevlar. You know what I'm talking about? Does this happen to me? You're praying, it's like everything's bouncing back. You know, we've all had those times where we're just a little bit dry, feel a little bit disconnected. I don't think that was the case. This was a steady movement towards lukewarmness in Timothy's life. Notice what he said in verse 6. He said, I remind you, Timothy. This wasn't the first time they've had this conversation. This wasn't the first time they've talked about this. I did a little count. I don't, I don't know that I caught them all, but I did a little count. Just in the two letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, eight times he talks about fear. Eight times he references it in his discussions with Timothy. This is not the first time they've had this conversation. He said, I'm reminding you and I need to be reminded not to drift. It's something left to our own devices. We'll let the world take over. And before we know it, we've just floated down river. He said, I remind you, Timothy. And he said to kindle afresh. That's the way it's worded in New American Standard. I think fan the flame is the way it's worded if you have an NIV. And I won't bore you with all the grammatical whys and wherefores in Greek, but in the original language, it talks about a continuous action. Not a one-time on the flame, but a constant, like with the bellows, a constantly blowing on the flame. Now, I was a Boy Scout when I was a teenager for all of about two weeks. I wasn't a model scout. I was, I was a no No fear of ever making Eagle Scout. I was a Boy Scout for all of collectively about two weeks. And I could not build a fire in the woods to save my life. If I was stranded in the woods and the only thing that stood between me and not surviving is the ability to build a fire for heat and to cook food, I would surely die. I could not do it to save my life. But here's what I do know. I've seen people who can do it. I've seen it done. And when do you fan the flame? I'm starting to die down, right? When it's burning hot, you don't need to fan it when it's burning hot. You feed it, absolutely, but you don't need to fan it then. It's also a danger when it gets too low, right? You have very little embers. If it gets too low and you blow on it, what happens? It goes out. Now, this is not a, a perfect analogy here. I don't believe there's any point in time in the, in the believer's life that the flame of the Holy Spirit can completely go out. I don't believe that's the case. I believe, and as a church, we believe in the doctrine of eternal security. That moment when you repented of sins and trusted in Jesus and His work alone on the cross for your salvation, you receive the gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And the gifts of God, the Scripture says, are irrevocable. You didn't earn that gift, and you're not going to unearn it. We believe in the doctrine of eternal security. There's no point in time when the flame of the Holy Spirit will completely go out. It's not a perfect illustration, a perfect analogy. 
But that flame can get so low, right, that you hardly notice it. That it's not putting off much heat at all. It's not having much of an impact on anything around it. That can become a very small flame, and I think that does describe many believers' lives. The flame has become so cold. There's so much lukewarmness because of drift. The, the, the people around you would scarcely even know you're a believer. There's no impact on the folks around you. And I think that's what was going on in Timothy's life. He said, how did you get here, Timothy? To struggle with fear like this, it's because drift is something you keep falling into. And his fear was linked to something. It was linked to doubt and shame. Look there at the first part of verse 8. He says, therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Now, Timothy was a pastor. Paul had taken him there to Ephesus and left him there to pastor that church. We read that at the beginning of 1 Timothy. Timothy was a pastor. And listen again to those words. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. That word ashamed, it's a key word. In this, in this passage. He uses it three times. Here in verse 8, he uses it in verse 12, again in verse 16. In this section where he's talking about fear in Timothy's life, he mentions this word ashamed three times. There's got to be a connection. He said this to Timothy in 1 Timothy, his first letter, chapter 4, verse 12. He said, let no one look down on you because of your youthfulness. Now, we don't know how old Timothy was, but certainly he was younger than a lot of the people in the church. They were looking down on him because of it. He said, don't let them do that, but rather be an example of all of those things, speech, conduct, faith, and love. See, this was an ongoing thing. Timothy was easily intimidated by those around him. Easily made to to sort of shut up and not not take a stand for Christ, not speak out, not stand firm when he should. Timothy was easily intimidated. And his fear would cause him to shrink back. And, And Paul links these two things together. His fear and being ashamed of the testimony. Think of those times in your life when you've shrunk back. right? When you should have said something about the about Christ. When you should have done something, the, for your friends or those around you encourage you to get involved in things you know you shouldn't be getting involved in, but you just go along to get along. Think about those times when you've shrunk back. You haven't said the right thing. You haven't stood up when you should have. And listen, we all have them. I have them too. I've had them in my life as well. Timothy was a pastor. He had them as well. We all have them. But why? Why do we do that? When we know the truth about Christ, we know that he was God in the flesh, came here, died on a cross so that you and I might spend eternity with God the Father in heaven. We know that, but why? Why do we shrink back like that? I think because somewhere deep down inside, this issue of ashamedness is in deep, dark places that you and I don't want to talk about and you and I don't want to admit. To be ashamed means to be reluctant to do something for fear of embarrassment. Now, you think about the times that you've shrunk back when you should have taken a stand for Christ and you didn't. Wasn't there something in your mind that said, what are they going to think? They might think I'm crazy. You actually believe that old myth? They might think I'm crazy. They might think that I'm weak. Oh, you, you religious people just need a crutch to lean on. They might think I'm weak. They might think I'm some kind of religious freak or Bible thumper. What might they think of me? And we let the fear of that rule us. That's called ashamed. And at the core of those times when we shrunk back, that's exactly what's going on somewhere in here in places we've not yet identified. And he says to Timothy, the, you're Fear is fed by this drift, and it's linked to these issues of doubt and shame. And if we aren't intentionally building our faith, we may very well be unintentionally opening opening the doors for Satan to plant the seeds of doubt and of fear. When I was growing up, my dad was a tremendous man. 
he passed away in 2003, but he was, a, he was a great man, a great father, great example to us, a wonderful grandfather to our girls. And my dad had an amazing ability. He could take any car. No matter what condition that car was in, my dad had this amazing ability to take that car and turn it into a total pile of junk. I've never seen anything like it. It's just absolutely incredible to see what he could do with a car. I remember this one car he bought when I was in high school. It wasn't new, but it was nice. It had the two things as a teenage boy I cared about. It was sporty and it was fast, and that's all I cared about. But it was cute, and it was nice, and it was a decent car. And over the next four years, my dad applied his magic to that car. And by the time I went off to basic training, four years later, the floorboards had completely rusted through. We could see the ground below. The, we were the Flintstones, y'all. We could see the ground below the car. And I thought, how did he do that? You know, my dad didn't look at a car when he bought it and saw it on the lot or, you know, went and see it with some private party and think, you know, that car is awfully nice, but I'm going to have to junk that thing up. He didn't go there with that intent. That wasn't his desire. How did he do that? A systematic program of neglect. That's how he did that. My dad had no mechanical skills when it came to a car. He had a toolbox in the garage that had a roll of duct tape a pair of pliers, and exactly 47,000 screwdrivers. And that was fine because he couldn't work on a car with any other tool if he had to, but apparently he didn't want to hire anybody else to do it either. This systematic program of neglect. But you know, that's what happens in many of our spiritual lives too. This systematic program of neglect, and before you know it, your faith looks a little like the Flintstones where you can see the road passing below you. Drift, that's what it's called. And does that describe your spiritual life this morning? Would you have to say, you know what, Pastor, amen, that's me. I'm in a drift. And if that is you, I've got good news. The Word of God often brings us to a point of despair over sin. But the good news is it doesn't leave us there. Paul lays out the problem for Timothy but he also lays out the solution. I'm not just going to leave you there, Timothy. I'm just not going to bring up the problem and then let you go. There's also a solution. Look at the last part of verse 8. He said, but, join with me now. But means we're sort of a change in direction. This is going on, but that. A change in, here's the problem, but here is the solution. But join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Listen, sometimes the problems that we have in life, big problems, complex problems, sometimes the solution's really not that difficult. Hard problems, sometimes it's easy answers to hard problems. I saw this on Facebook yesterday. And I thought, how fitting for this message. I just had to solve it. I'll, ju I'll just leave that up there for a second. Sometimes the easiest way to solve a problem is simply to stop participating in it. Stop allowing it to be a problem. Sometimes the complex problems in our lives have some of the easiest solutions. And he says, Timothy, listen, you feel powerless? Because when you're in fear and overcome by fear and afraid of something, you feel powerless, Right? If I knew I could defeat this thing, then I wouldn't be afraid of it. He said, you feel powerless, Timothy? Here's the simple answer. Tap back into the source of power that God has already given you. There's the simple answer. Verse 7 and 8, he uses the same word. Power is how it's translated into English. It's the Greek word dynamis. You can hear what English words we get out of that. Dynamic, dynamo, dynamite. Those are the words we get out of that. It means overwhelming, explosive power. He said, this is, this is a complicated problem. This is a big issue in your life, Timothy. But the solution's not that difficult. God has already given you the power. See, listen, we're, we're powerless to overcome, um, overcome fear on our own. 
But God, through the Holy Spirit, has provided us with all the power that we need. I'm amazed to watch him at work and see how he lines things together. Twice this past week, I've been involved in small groups that were talking about compromise and and the, the problems that that brings and talking about how to respond and how to overcome that. Once in the pastor's Bible study on Tuesday night, we're, we're doing a series right now called What Does the Bible Say About? It's a question and answer series, so you're filling in the blanks. And this past week, we were looking at what does the Bible say about how to, be, how to represent Christ in the workplace? And the first place we started was this idea of no compromise, not compromising our faith. And we talked about compromise and, and the destructive power of it. Thursday night at the men's Bible study, we were studying Samson, this man who's incredibly strong physically, yet incredibly weak spiritually. And one of the problems Samson had was compromise. And I, just couldn't, I just couldn't get over how, how he links these things together. One of the things we were talking about, talking about Samson, was why is it so important that we admit our weakness? Why, do we, why is it so important for us to embrace that? And here's the thing. Because fear and pride will keep you from acknowledging it. Fear and pride will cause you to say, I got this. I can handle this. I can handle anything. That's what fear and pride will tell you. It'll keep you from acknowledging your weakness. And listen, you won't reach for his power as long as you think you can handle it. As long as you think you're strong enough to overcome anything in your life, you will not reach for the power of God. But here's the simple answer. God has already put in us the explosive, overwhelming power to deal with anything, to overcome fear. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul said this, His power is made perfect in our, you can probably answer that, in our weakness. That's when we most realize the power of God in our lives. Listen to Romans 8, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 11. He said, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Chew on that for just a minute. That the power that gave life to a dead man lives in each of us as a believer in Christ. And we feel powerless. What's the answer? He says to Timothy, just tap back into that power. We have to embrace our weakness, recognize our need for it. And when we come to those moments, listen again to verse 9. When we're overwhelmed and we feel fearful and we don't know what to do, look at verse 9. He said, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Listen, allow that to encourage you in those moments. That before God spoke the first word of creation, you were on his mind. He was thinking about you and thinking about me. It said that God gave us those purposes before, from all eternity. Before he spoke anything, he was thinking about you. And how was he going to wire you? How was he going to gift you? How was he going to equip you? Where was he going to place you for such a time as this? Think about that in those moments. When you feel overwhelmed, when you feel powerless, you say, God, I'm not sure why I'm here. I'm not sure I can handle it. To know that he thought about that moment from before he even created the universe. And let this encourage you, verse 10. But now that has been revealed to us by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death. There is one problem that man has not yet figured out how to conquer that is the issue of death and the one thing that god that man has not been able to conquer yet is the one thing that jesus conquered and listen if he can conquer this which is way up here in your life he can conquer and abolish death whatever it is that you're afraid of 
Whatever it is has got you down. Whatever it is that you feel overwhelmed by, if he can conquer this, the one thing that no man has ever been able to figure out how to conquer, he can deal with that thing in your life. He can deal with that. Got a little off in my slides here. Let me back up and get to where we should be. Jesus conquered death so he can deal with the situation in your life. It's a simple solution, a simple answer. But we often make it a lot more complicated than it is. Listen, when you feel powerless, simply tap back in to the power that God has already given us. Because here's the thing, there is the real possibility of victory. You can live in victory once and for all over that fear. Once and for all over that doubt. You can live in victory. Look at verse 11. He said, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. And for this reason, I also suffer these things. He's suffering for the cause of Christ. But I am not ashamed. Listen, he links those two things together, you remember. He said, listen, one of the causes, one of the problems in your life, Timothy is you fear because somewhere deep down inside you are ashamed. Because I've conquered this. I am not ashamed, for I know who I, have, who I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him to that day. Victory is possible because our faith is in a person, not a program. It's not about learning more rules. Learning more things, if I just follow all the rules better, then I'll finally live in victory over fear. Religion doesn't give us victory. Religion moves us in the other way, other direction. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. He said that I may know Him. Not that I may know a set of things better, that I may know some facts better, but that I may know the person, Jesus Christ, better. Religion never saves. Religion brings guilt. It brings shame. It brings burdens to us. It stokes our fear. It doesn't relieve it. It says I'm never enough. I'll never get it right. I simply can't do it. That's what religion says to us. But a relationship with Jesus brings victory. And it brings victory because, as he said in 1 Corinthians 15, he's already taken the sting of death. He's already overcome. It brings victory because he's right there with you in that moment. It brings victory because he knows. The Bible says he's tempted in all ways like you and I, and yet without sin, so that we can come to him. He can help us in our moment of temptation. He's been where you are. He's experienced whatever it is you're experiencing. And he knows the way out. That's how we experience victory. To look to him, to trust in him, simply believe that and embrace that. And he's proven his reliability over and over and over. One of the things we were talking about in the pastor's Bible study on Tuesday is how so often there is a gap between Sunday morning me and Monday morning me. And we can sit in this room and we read things like that, that Jesus has proven his reliability over and over. And on Sunday morning we say, yes, amen, and we believe it and we embrace it and we're all about it. And then the first challenge hits Monday afternoon. And what happens then? We question it and we doubt it. And there is this gap often between where we are, where our faith is on Sunday, and where our faith is on Monday. But Paul said, listen, I don't, it's not that I just know who I have believed in, but I am convinced of why I believe it. Now listen, Paul had seen Jesus over and over and over again come through. In shipwrecks, in imprisonments, in times when he was hated and mocked, when he was abandoned, when he was alone, and every single time he said, I am convinced. He writes this at the end of his life, looking back at all of that. And he says, despite all of that, maybe even because of all of that, I am absolutely convinced that he is able. He has proven himself and proven his reliability. And if you and I want to live in victory over fear, we come and face this giant, whatever it is. And we're afraid of it. 
and the doubt. Satan tries to bring up the doubt in our mind and say, can God really lance that? Has God really defeated that? See, he's proven it. I know who I have believed. I am convinced he is able. Now, how do you do that? Live in victory over fear. That sounds good from the pulpit, right? To say you can. But how do you do that? How do you make that a reality? How do you break a bad habit? Now, you can say to yourself, I'm just not going to do that anymore. You know, if you've ever tried to quit smoking, if, you know, if, if that's something you struggle with, you tried to quit smoking. How many times did you just say, I'm not going to do that anymore? And you can say that about, about a bad habit. I'm just not going to do that anymore. But then a couple weeks later, you have to ask yourself, how's that working out for me? How do, you, how do you replace a bad habit? How do you get rid of a bad habit? You replace it with a good one. You replace it with a new habit. We get into this habit of drift. Let me, let me encourage you. Replace that bad habit of drift, of unintentional drift, with the habit of intentionally being a disciple that makes disciples. That's what Jesus called us to be. That's what he's called us to do. Be disciples that make disciples. Get plugged into that small group. Take, that, take 10 or 15 minutes of that time you would otherwise waste on social media or on video games at home and use that for getting in the Word of God, getting into prayer with Him. Intentionally build this, this discipline of being a disciple who's making disciples. Replace that habit of, of failing again because you were absolutely sure you could handle it this time. Replace that habit with embracing your weakness and crying out, Lord, I, I am desperate for your power in this moment. And replace the habit of questioning him, relying on religion, with the habit of trusting, knowing and trusting the person of Christ and what he has done time and again and what he'll do one more time. Listen, most of us can put on a pretty good face. You know, we've got the game face, the church face. You know what I'm talking about. Come to church on Sunday and everything's great. You know, people ask, how's, how's your week? My week was great. Everything's great. You know, we put, on a, we put on a pretty good game face. And when it comes to fear and its devastating effects, most of, particularly in a military audience, we're not going to admit I'm afraid of anything. No fear. I see that on people's t-shirts on the back windows of the car all the time. We put on a pretty good face when it comes to those things. But if you really want to live a life, that isn't ruled by doubt, that isn't ruled by fear, stop drifting. Stop drifting. Tap into the power that God has already put within you. Now, of course, that's not possible if you're here this morning and you say, you know, I don't, I'm not certain that I know Christ. I'm not certain of the status of my relationship. I can't look back at a time in my life and say, I know at that point in time I repented of sins and I trusted in Him as for my for my salvation. If you can't think of that time, and you're not certain, if you passed right now from this life into eternity, you're not certain where you would spend eternity. See, that's where it begins. You can't even begin to tap into that power without a relationship with Christ. Now, if you're here this morning, you've got questions about what that looks like in your life. And you want to talk to somebody about that, I'll be available after the service. I'm going to hang, hang out right down front here. And you just come forward when the service is over and just say, I need to know Jesus. Simple as that. You don't have to have any grand theological statement, just that. And I'll be glad to talk with you and pray with you and introduce you to this one who can radically alter, radically change your life and radically change your eternity. Or maybe you're, you are a child of God here this morning, but you're still you're struggling with this. You're wrestling with this. And you just need to be encouraged. You need someone to pray with you. I'll be available to do that after the service as well. Or later on, reach out and touch me, pastor at avianobaptist.church, or hit me on Facebook Messenger, hit me up on WhatsApp. We're glad we had the opportunity to gather together this morning. It's good to see you all this morning. I know we have a, a week coming up, and you might say I'm a little bit concerned about the Sunday-Monday gap. You know I'll be praying for you. That you and I will have the ability, to, the, the presence of mind to tap into this power so that we can live boldly for Christ, not just in here where it's easy, but out there where it's hard. And I do hope you have a blessed week, and I want to just remind you of a couple of things before I dismiss our time and pray us out of here. 
Just remind you of a couple of things. The book fair is going on downstairs, so stop down there and grab whatever it is that you want. I'll hang out here long enough to not lock you in the building afterwards. If you are a first-time guest with us this morning, welcome. We're glad you were here this morning. Don't forget to put that uh, welcome slip in one of the offering plates in the back. If you grabbed the little prayer slip as you came in this morning, you wrote, wrote down a prayer request, drop that in the offering plate in the back as well. Check out the announcements this afternoon so that you know what's going on. Be in prayer about how God's going to use you in the fundraising project for our new building coming up. Well, let's stand together and let me dismiss our time and pray us out of here. Father, what an amazing God you are. You not only saved us, you gave us your Holy Spirit as, as your down payment for our inheritance. You gave us your Holy Spirit to equip us for the work that you have for us. You gave us your Holy Spirit so that we can have victory, and power over these things in our lives like fear and doubt and shame. Father, I pray for those that are here this morning, those that were in the first service, those that are joining us via YouTube. And I pray that as we go through the, the day-to-day battle, yes, it is a battle of living for you. Lord, help us to just tap into your power, to experience it and be amazed like Paul was time and again for how you come through. And Father, I pray for the future that you've got for us. Here in Aviano, as you move us around as a military community, that we might be intentionally involved in making disciples wherever it is that we go out in the Aviano community this week. Lord, would you bless us now as we go from this place, as we dismiss from here, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.